I'm going to talk, uh, and Finn did a really good job of introducing some of this stuff, so we'll, we'll go over some of it again, but in a different light. A little bit of an overview of my presentation. I'll talk a little bit about putting the Fraser Basin in context with the rest of British Columbia. Some of the facts behind food security, agriculture significance of the Fraser Basin and especially the Fraser Valley, the impacts of ocean rise and climate change on Fraser River salinity, and what we're trying to do to combat the salinity through a program that we're working on with some people are actually in the room today that are working on that project. So Finn showed a similar project, uh, process. You know, 25% of the area in British Columbia is drained by the Fraser River. So it's very significant. BC itself is also very significant. Sorry, Eric, I just had to put this up there. It kind of minimizes Scotland as being quite small, but <laughs> when you look at British Columbia, it is larger than the United Kingdom by far, probably twice as large or maybe even more. I'm going to show you a few slides. Uh, pictures here go very quickly. Just take a look at these pictures as I go through them and see what you think about these pictures, and I'll tell you what my thought comes to very quickly. Foodlands, grain. Peace River, Dairy, Fraser Valley, Interior BC, Forage and Berries, Fraser Valley, Interior British Columbia as well. Fruits and Vegetables, Okanagan Valley. Beef lands, food, uh, beef producers in the rangelands and the caribou and around Kamloops. So, what is those, what do they show you? When I look at those pictures, it tells you something. Agriculture is big. Actually, in BC, it's very small, but when you look at the landscape, it takes up a lot of area. It, it takes area to grow all of our food. If we look at food self-reliance in British Columbia, we produce about, don't worry about all the numbers there, but we produce about 48% of the food that we eat in the province. We grow some things in abundance, like tree fruits, which you export but there's a lot of vegetables that we cannot grow in the summertime, we import in the wintertime because we can't grow them. Ironically, we export tomatoes in the wintertime from our greenhouses and they go to California. And we bring tomatoes in from California as well, so there's some trade-off in there. But for the most part, we, we only grow half, we don't grow any of our sugar and other things. So um, there's huge potential to increase our growth of agriculture in British Columbia if we want to become food secure, which is one of the policies that the Ministry of Agriculture has talked about. So, if we look at Canada's food guide to healthy eating, BC self-reliance is only 34%. So it tells you we eat a lot of junk foods and things like that that aren't healthy eating, that um, we don't grow in the province either necessarily, but it drops to 34%. Every person on this planet needs about a half a hectare of land to grow their food your milk, your dairy, your beef, your proteins, your vegetables, it takes up about a half a hectare. Somewhere in the world, it has to be grown if you want to have a healthy diet. So to produce a healthy diet for British Columbians, and this is going back now about 10 years, at that time, we needed about 2.15 million hectares of production, of which we needed to irrigate at least 215,000 hectares in the province. That number will now be higher with 10 years later, we only irrigate 120,000 hectares in British Columbia. You are the first group here that will hear about this last number. In fact, if you read the article in the Vancouver Sun a week or so ago, it said 190,000 hectares. And I think what happened over time, at one time we had estimated 190,000 acres. Somebody converted it to 190,000 hectares. That's been in all the documentations, the press, agriculture, Agri-Food Canada documents will all say 190,000 hectares. But as you'll see later, I'll talk about another project that we've been doing, and I added up all the numbers, and the best I can get to is 120,000 hectares. So we're roughly about irrigating half the land that we need to irrigate to produce our food in the province. So we need to grow. We'll need to get to 2.78 million hectares. Total irrigate will have to go to about 307,000. So we need another 187,000 hectares of irrigation. The ALR? is 4.6 million hectares. So the ALR is big enough. The land is there. What the key thing about the land reserve is that we are reserved the land, we have not reserved the water to go with the land. 
and you can't really grow much on the land without the water. So luckily, one of the things under the new Water Sustainability Act, there's now a clause in there that says that we can set up agriculture water reserves to reserve the water for the future for our agricultural lands. That's going to be a very convoluted thing to try to get done. I'm not going to talk much about that today. If somebody has any questions, we can maybe address it in question and answer period. So, and a lot of our irrigated lands are very close to urban areas, urban centers. Don't need to read this. I put it up there as a reminder to myself. The Ministry of Agriculture does have a thing in there, a statement in their agriculture food strategy that says ensuring access to water for farming. So that comes back to the water reserve, getting licensing, groundwater license, all the things that we need to do. So it is a part of the policy for the ministry um, and something that they're shooting towards, although it's not a quick fix as you'll see as we move along here. So let's look at the Fraser Basin. The Fraser Basin has 51% of the provincial ALR. The ALR percentage of the basin is only about 10% though. And if we look at the Fraser Basin, if I go back, I was showing you a slide, the little box at the bottom. The little box at the bottom, the ALR in the Fraser Valley, which is by, far, by the way, our most productive agricultural lands are right here in the Fraser Valley. The most productive agricultural lands that we have in Canada, for the most part, are in the Fraser Valley. So it's about 137,000 hectares. The Fraser Valley ALR is about 5.8% of the total ALR uh, in the Fraser Basin and only less than 3% of the total ALR in British Columbia. But here's the interesting fact. 50% of the provincial farm gate receipts come from the Fraser Valley. So we're producing, farmers are getting half their dollars in the entire province from that less than 3% of the ALR. And that's not something that people usually put together, right? We have this growing city, this growing metropolis, lots of people moving into the Fraser Valley. We're over 2, 2.25 million, something like that in the Fraser Valley. Yet we have this ALR that's very important to us and we're getting all these things happening in the ALR that shouldn't be happening. Bigger homes, industry setting up illegally. And hopefully under this new government, we'll get some more enforcement on the ALR so we can protect these valuable farmlands because that is our food supply for the future. And you'll see how this ties in more as we move along. And why 50% of the provincial farm gate receipts? And it's because of those slides on the right. It's the high value production. You know, cranberries, blueberries, nursery crops, uh, greenhouses, dairy. They, they drive a lot of the farm gate receipts. So if we look at the Fraser Valley, we're sort of focusing down into this region. The Ministry of Agriculture, over about the last 10 years now, have been developing a land use inventory on agricultural lands and the agriculture water demand model correlates to that. I'm going to show you some of those numbers that come out of that as we move along. This is a land use inventory map of uh, Richmond, I believe, am I right? Yes, it is, City of Richmond. And so when we do the land use inventory, we do it property by property and you can get very good results as to what is being grown where. And, this, and the GIS system very quickly pulls it up. Everything in blue is cranberries and all the other crops are shown there. We can do that now for almost uh, the entire province except for the Caribou and the Peace River where we have not completed land use inventory, so the northern part of BC, but all the southern part of BC, Vancouver Island, except for Capital Regional District, Fraser Valley and all that has been done. So we can get very, very good information. So if you look at um, agricultural land use in the Fraser Valley, Total ALR land, I've broken it down between Metro Vancouver Regional District and the Fraser Valley Regional District. Total ALR land in the Fraser Valley in the far right, 132,000 hectares. Area crop is only 68,000. So we've got a lot of land in the ALR that can still grow crops. The area irrigated is 28,354 hectares. So I just want to check. Um, the area irrigated in the Fraser Valley exceeds the area irrigated in the Okanagan. We have 28,354 hectares of irrigation in the Fraser Valley. We only have 21,000 in the Okanagan. And most people would have thought, well, where is our irrigation in the province? It's in the Okanagan. It's hot, it's dry, everybody's irrigating. But we irrigate more in the Fraser Valley. And that has been a huge growth in the last 20 years because our climate is changing, our crops are getting more valuable. 
Farmers need irrigation to make sure that they could sustain that, that growth of that crop, make sure we get good production. So irrigation has taken off since I started my career 35 years ago. I'm not the one responsible for it, but it has happened. We look at crops that are irrigated in the Fraser Valley. This information is coming from the water demand model that we can run. We can run that model per property, per region, by watershed, by aquifer area. It's all kinds of different ways we could run that data. And here's just some of the data for Metro Vancouver. You can see the total area is 28,000 hectares uh, in area. Area irrigated is 13,000 hectares in Metro Van. I'm looking at the numbers across the bottom. Blueberries is the, by far the irrigated, big, highest irrigated crop, followed by cranberries. Oh, sorry, forage is still the biggest. Farmers with forage, which we think we don't irrigate, they have irrigation systems. They may not use them every year, but they have them. The numbers on the far right have highlighted two. What is the irrigation demand for those crops? Blueberries is 332 millimeters. Forage is 561 millimeters. Blueberries need less water, mainly because we're using drip irrigation systems on them and so they, need, they have a lower demand. And forage is one of the highest demands. On average, we're using about 441 millimeters per, uh, over the area, which is about a depth, something like that. So it needs a lot of water. Your agriculture needs a lot of water to grow their foods. If we look at the entire Fraser Valley, we have 28,000, as I mentioned before, 345 54 uh, hectares that are irrigated, we can calculate the water demand. That acreage that we're irrigating today on a hot, dry year, if we need that water, it's 128 million cubic meters is what we use in the Fraser Valley. The Fraser River flows at 10,000 cubic meters per second or more at freshet, and it will get as low as about 1,500 cubic meters per second in later summer, in August and in September. Even at this low flow, the Fraser River can supply the 128 million cubic meters in one day, which is very surprising. At high flow, it can supply it in about six hours. Of course, we don't take the whole Fraser River and dump it on the agricultural land, but that, that's the equivalent. So people always ask, well, is this growth going to impact the Fraser River. No, it's such a minuscule amount of water that we're actually taking out of the river, we wouldn't notice it. So the Fraser River is awesome. It's in the Fraser Valley, it's where we get most of our irrigation from, and there's potential there to grow a lot more. But we have to build the infrastructure to do that. So if you look at this map of the, the Fraser Valley, um, and you can see that's the ALR boundaries that we have there. One of the things that we could do with this model is we can say, okay, we know what we're irrigating today, but what can we irrigate in the future? And so we, we apply some rules to it. The, the, the farm has to be no further than 1,000 meters from a surface water supply or a groundwater supply or a water purveyor. It has to be good class land, must be in the ALR, can't be any higher than 750 meters of elevation. The property can't be any higher than 125 meters above the water source because we're thinking that's high enough to pump. When we do that, and this is a map of Metro Vancouver, all of the green areas are what we are irrigating today. All of the red areas are lands that are currently not irrigated but could be irrigated in the future quite easily if we built the infrastructure of farmers wanted water. In some cases, we already have the infrastructure there. Farmers just haven't aren't growing crops where they see the need to irrigate. But there's huge potential in a region that we have a lot of people living in to expand our agriculture. So if we look at what's happening in 2013, 128 million cubic meters, if we take that irrigated expansion to 2065 and let's say we irrigate all the lands that we could irrigate, we're going to increase that to 272 million cubic meters. So it's about a well, a little over two times the amount of water that we're going to need. The Fraser Valley has the potential to irrigate an additional 40,000 hectares. That's 21% of the 187,000 hectares that we need additionally to get to food security for the entire province. So the Fraser Valley is very significant. It can get us 20% of the way there just in this little valley. More than half of that 21% growth is in the metro van area, which again is surprising. You know, surprising. You think, oh man, we've got this big city, yet we have this real huge potential for growth in agriculture there. 
So then we look at climate change. The model also has climate change parameters in it. We have about 12 global climate change models. We can run them and get information about what's going to happen 50 years in the future, whatever. I'm not combining the potential growth with what climate change tells us here, but I just ran, we ran a number of climate change scenarios, and you can see that we're seeing an increase anywhere from about, uh, in Metro Vancouver, up to 63, 30 to 63% 50 years from now. Fraser Valley Regional District, a little bit higher. It's more inland, it's hotter, it's gonna be drier. We need even more water. Uh, total anywhere from 42 to 75%. Then if you put your build out on there, it's still a lot more water, but still something the Fraser River can supply. If we look at what's happening in climate change, you can have, see what happened this summer, and you can see what happened in 2003. And there's an interesting fact about these two years, 2003 and 2017. We'll talk, start with 2017. If you remember this spring, what was it like? Wet, 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 wet. Everybody's complaining. We're flooded out till about June. And then it started getting hot, 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 hot. And then we had no more rain. And then we had all the fires. We had all these things happening in BC, right? So we thought, OK, um, let's go back to 2003. The same thing happened in 2003. In fact, 2003, the spring in 2003 was wetter than in 2017 was the third wettest spring on record, and 2017 was maybe the fourth or fifth. It was just behind 2003. So we had a wet spring. And then we had this tremendously hot summer. And we had all these fires that were burning in Kelowna and Kamloops and all these other centers, if you remember. And it's quite a few years ago, so some of us have forgotten. But we're do the same thing happened this year as what happened back then. So I remember, and I knew that, and so I'm sitting here in the spring, and everybody's complaining about it being wet, and I said, Oh, just you wait. <laughs> this is patterning 2003, and we're going to get this hot summer, and we're going to have a bunch of fires. And then, not, not that I'm a prophet or anything else, just went back in history, but that's exactly what happened. So people forget some of the things that happened in the past, right? So climate change, build out, all those things are going to mean more water, huge infrastructure, we're going to irrigate all these lands, but we don't have to worry about the Fraser River being able to supply that water if we can build the infrastructure and build it properly and be, build it sustainably and all of that. In fact, if you look at the floodplain of the Fraser River, the green area is the current floodplain. And I want you to keep, keep atten attention where the green area is. And then if we look at some of this, this is the aquifers in Metro Vancouver. And if you looked at the other aquifers in the area, you will see that a lot of the ALR land is mimicking very much what you see in the floodplain, except along here. Around here, it's not really part of the floodplain, all that area in there. And that's because it's higher land, it's not right up against the Fraser, and that's where all of our good aquifers are. We pump the water from groundwater. So all of this area here, supplied by the Fraser River, and over here, it's groundwater. So predominantly, we rely on the Fraser River for water. There's very few streams in the Fraser Valley that we can actually get water out of. They're low flowing streams, they dry up later in the summer. And so um, they're not really good sources for irrigation. If you've got groundwater, it's a good source. But otherwise, we're relying on the Fraser River. So Metro Vancouver ALR, I mentioned it's 13,000 hectares. About 20 to 25% of the provincial farm gate receipts come out of the Metro Van Regional District. So it's pretty high as well, just this little area that we're talking about. And so I want to now um, focus in on, like I noticed I started with a big province, Fraser Basin, Fraser Valley. Now I'm going to focus in on Delta Richmond. Because these are, our, these are our vegetable and food lands. They're very important to us. They're very, like I said, the best lands in the province. And this is the area that we have really big concerns about water supply in the future. And I'll explain why. I'm just going to show a hydrograph of the Fraser River. And you can see that we have low flows in the Fraser around 1,000. This is for the year 2011, so it may have been a little bit lower than normal. The key time and period that we're always looking at is August, September quite often. Here the flows are quite high. We can get as low as 1,500 cubic meters in this particular year is quite high. And we can get freshets up around 10 or 12. You know, it can change from year to year. But basically the hydrograph looks like this. A lot of water available in early summer not so much water available in August, September. And it's this low flow in August, September that's causing us, going to cause us grief in the lower Fraser River. Um, 
I have been really poor at acknowledging people that actually have provided us with slides, but I did acknowledge these two. This work was done by EBA Tetratech under contract to DFI and working with Delta and others to figure out what's going on in the Fraser River. So uh, the next few slides is all out of this study that they did. And I'm, I'm sure if you're interested in the study, we can get it to you. So if you look at the Fraser um, River, the salinity wedge during high tides, and this is a chainage from sand heads as you go up river. And so you can see here about 10 kilometers up river, we can get salinity levels coming at the lower part of the river uh, during high tides. If we go to a low tide, that salinity wedge, first of all, it moves up to the top of the river, and it goes up much further up the river, about 18 kilometers. We have our irrigation intakes in along here. We can't take the water when it's saline, because it'll damage the crops. So we have sensors, the system has to shut down, we can't take the water in. So of course, if you're farmers in Richmond and Delta, you would be concerned about what is happening to the salinity wedge and what's going to happen under climate change when our oceans go higher and the Fraser River maybe goes into a lower drought flow. So we have lower water flows in the river combined with a higher ocean level. And so that's something that we studied and we'll show you some of the results. Oh, this is just a, a table that shows you, yes, there are crops that are tolerant to salinity water, but we grow a lot of cranberries in Richmond and Delta and they're the least tolerant and our target level is 400 microsiemens. We can't, I know it says 0.7 here, which would be 700, but at 400, we cut it off. The irrigation has to shut down. We can't take the water in, because even though we may have other crops that are more tolerant, the cranberries are not tolerant, and we can't separate the water between one crop and the other. So this is a little bit hard to see, but we have, I have three sites mentioned here. Site one, which is 28 kilometers upstream, Site two is 24 kilometers, and site three is 22 kilometers upstream. And on this map, they're showing us here, here, and here. And you can see the salinity sort of goes out the side, and we have better water quality on this side, which is good for us, not so good for Richmond. Sorry, when I say us, I meant DFI. I work for DFI, so I said us, but it's not really myself. It's like Richmond has got bigger problems because of, of the way the salinity goes up the river. Delta is a little bit better off. But here are some of the results that came out of the study. And if we look at the top one, if we're looking at near-term effects, meaning now, if we had sea level rise and a flow rate at the site one, which is the furthest upstream, at a flow rate of 2,000 cubic meters per second, we could pretty well, at site one, which is way up here, we can almost take water 24 hours a day. But if the flow drops to 1,000 cubic meters, we have a drought on the Fraser River, we're down to four, 2.8 or 3.2 hours per day, depending on the time of year. So we're losing a huge potential of that window to take water in because of that low flow potential on the Fraser River. If we look at long-term effects, which is like 50 years from now, oh, by the way, this is a sea level rise of zero meters, and this is a modest rise of 0.3 meters, so not a very high rise, a little over a foot. Um, if we look at long-term effects, uh, which is a higher um, of sea level rise, this drops tremendously. Like we get to almost no water 50 years from now. So that's, uh, that's a concern. Like what are we going to be able to do to these lands? We can't irrigate them if we can't get water to them. We can go further up the river. We could go up around the bend here and take water back. It's very costly. What we found when we modeled this thing that the model kind of crashed. It shows that the salinity wedge can almost get up to the Portman Bridge. And we never expected it to go that far, so we had to rechange the parameters to sort of say, where will it go? I don't think it'll ever get to the Portman Bridge, but something that the model showed could happen under certain conditions. If we look at, uh, again, go to site one, uh, long-term effects of sea rise and flow, river flow rate at site one and site two, now we're pretty good water quality. If the sea level goes up one meter, um, still not bad depending at site two, it starts to get reduced here under normal flows or wet flows, it's better. Under normal flows, it's not so good. And if we get two meters sea level rise, we're pretty well done. We're not gonna get much water. Long-term effects, same kind of effect. We're not going to get, this is, this is long-term effects with dredging. The point of this slide here is that 
I've been talking about the sea level rise and flows on the Fraser. It's a combination of those two that tells us how far that salinity wedge is going to move up. But the tunnel, right now it's been canceled, but if we built that new bridge to replace the tunnel and we actually took the tunnel out, the tunnel doesn't actually hold back any cellulite water. But the fact that the tunnel can come out, the port could say, hey, wait a minute, there's no tunnel in the way anymore. We can actually dredge deeper, get bigger ships to come in and go further up the river and do other things, which in itself has other implications. But the fact that they could dredge deeper means the salinity wedge can move up very quicker and faster, and that would in itself have a huge effect. So if you modeled, and I haven't shown that here, but if you modeled ocean rise, drought on the Fraser, dredging, there's just not much going to happen. And so um, Delta Farmers Institute, of course, has sort of said, we've got to get a handle on this, and we've got to know what's going on, because if anybody comes along and starts talking about dredging on the Fraser, we want to be in a position to say, wait a minute, we've done some study, we've done some work that says this has major implications to our water supply. So um, there's more detail in the report for those that are really interested. You can go and get the report and look at it. So what are we doing about that today? Well, one of the things we need to do is look at potential intakes, what's happening. So we looked at sites up at Anacis. This is monitoring sites, by the way. These are not necessarily intake sites. We looked at monitoring at the Anacis Island. We decided to forgo that because it's too far upstream. Alex Fraser Bridge, the Tasker Pump Station, which is the current pump station that Delta takes the water into all this area in Delta. So we've, we've enhanced the monitoring there. We're looking at, um, they've got, Delta already has monitoring in Selection Slough. Uh, West of Mountain Bridge we're looking at, and Tambaline Slough has already got some monitoring stations as well. So let me go through that a little bit. This is sort of showing the or ortho photograph. The two yellow ones is what we've put in. We've put in a, and these are the three sites that the model reports showed, right? So they are quite a ways upstream. We've put the sensor in at the Alex Fraser Bridge, and it's starting to collect data now. We just completed the Tasker pump station sensor, added a few sensors on there. It's now should be up and running and collecting data. By the way, we're going to put this data online. So you can go right to NHC's website and you can look at what's going on there with salinity. If we can, it's not, I know Harold's not done yet, but that's where we're going, right? So, uh, so those two are in. The people on West of Island are very concerned because, again, lots of good agricultural land. We don't have very good intakes there. We have one on Tambaline Slough. We don't have anything anywhere else at this point in time. And we want to look at, can we get fresh water here? So we're looking at two sites here to put in salinity monitoring. I'll show you pictures of those in a second. And we're potentially looking at another site right here, which we haven't got to yet, and we'll look at if there's feasibility to do this. Now, putting in a salinity sensor, you think, well, that's easy. Just put something in the river and monitor. It is not easy. It has to be secure. It can't be hit by a barge. It has to be on a piling. There's not a lot of pilings that barges don't come up against. So we had to look for sites that were secure. We could put a sensor on, get the approval, go through all that kind of stuff. So it's a, it's a long process to get that to happen. But I think we've got approvals for the four, four sites that we've talked about here. So upstream of the Alex Fraser Bridge, we found some, found some pilings there. This is what it looked like. This is what our unit looks like now. It's installed on this piling. We also needed depth. We needed a good depth of about eight meters, so because when the river drops, we have to measure the, the profile. We didn't want to be on a bench when we only have a couple of meters of water, so that also limited us. So that's installed, got a solar sensor on there. It all runs by itself, sends the data back to Delta. Tasker station, you can't really see it because there's a big intake that's underwater here. They had a sensor, we've added, Delta did, and we've added another sensor to that so we can get more data of what's happening in the profile of the river at that point in time, and that's this location right here. Tambaline Slough, which is on West Dem Island. We're proposing to put a sensor here, a sensor here. This is just a collection box to get the data from the sensors, and they already have a sensor here, which we're going to upgrade and put another sensor on. So we're looking at two or three sensors along here. This is a challenge because if you look at West of Island, we're talking about this area right here, and this is where the flood box is now, and you're looking out to this channel right here that's out there. Trying to put something in here on the river bottom, there's no pilings, gets protected that we don't get a gill netter or something else dragging it up. It's a bit of a challenge, but we're going to see if we can get this to work. We've got approval for it, and we're hopefully installing this in the next month or so. This is the existing flood box. 
uh, that sits right here where they already have some sensors on it. And then this is uh, also a new site that we have got approval for now. It's right by the West Island Bridge right here. Um, it's right down here. Call it the Gun Club site. There's some pilings there that we're, we're, we've been allowed to use, and so we're putting sensors there. The nice thing about this location is that the water is very deep. If we can get good water quality here, we have an issue about how do we get the good quality water from here onto West Am Island. There's no ditch or anything we can pump into, so the infrastructure to build something from here, if that's where we want to go in the future, to build it out onto the island here with pumps and ditches and or pipes could be significant. So um, that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, we're going to try to run these as long as we can because getting data for one year doesn't really do any good. You have to run it for a number of, day, a number of years. And then that really doesn't tell you what's going to happen 30 years down the road. But what it will tell us is if the modeling work that's been done by uh, EBA TetraTech is at all good. Because if we can model what they say what happens today, then we can maybe have a little bit more assurances about their modeling for the future. So that's one of the things. And plus, we need to start investigating other potential intakes. And so before you spend millions of dollars putting in an intake, and we're talking here, probably this, this system here was $20 million. So we're not talking about a small project. They're big projects. Before you invest in that, there's a lot of things we have to find out. And first one is, do we have enough water there to make it worthwhile? That project was, the sensor project is funded by a number of people that I've listed up here, probably too numerous to mention, but we have a lot of funders, a lot of people are interested in this. So we're, we're pretty well funded and we think we can put in this additional site that Delta was interested in and we'll see if we can get that done here in the next little bit.